Today on episode 17 of the Play Guitar Podcast, I start part one of the path to great guitar tone. It's all about what guitar to get for the style that you want to play. Also, I've got some listener feedback, so stay tuned. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 17 of the Play Guitar Podcast. I'm Lee, and this is the podcast that's determined to make you a better guitar player. No matter if you're just starting out or you've been playing for years, this is the show that'll help you become the guitarist that you always wanted to be. On today's episode titled The Path to Great Guitar Tone Part 1, I'm going to start to help players who are unsure of what equipment to use for different styles of music. This is a big topic and there's never an easy answer, but when you take a look at the classic recordings of your favorite style of music, you start to see some similarities in the gear that's used. Certain guitars and amps and pedals tend to be used to get certain sounds in a style. And that classic gear is a great starting point. Once you know what the common gear is for your style, you can then decide to either emulate those sounds or then to go for something different. You'll have your frame of reference. Last week I had a marathon episode full of tips about how to make small changes to the minor pentatonic scale and it'll get you big rewards. It was filled full of things to try on the guitar and I wanted to change it up a bit today and and work on some knowledge that'll help you move forward. So I thought I'd start my series on getting the right tone. I've had several questions about that, and I thought, now's the time to do it. So getting the right tone is pretty important. I know when when my tone is not right, it's no fun at all. Um, I played a festival one time. I remember it was in West Virginia, and this was the one where I had one of my biggest guitar fails ever. Um, I was extremely excited to get there on the way when we were driving up to the festival. I remember how excited I was, mostly because one of my favorite guitar players was also going to be there. He was also playing, uh, and that was Sonny Landreth, one of my favorites. And we pulled in, and then we started to unload at the festival. And, and sometimes at these festivals, you just sit around and wait for hours and hours until it's time for you to play. But this was not one of those times. We unloaded and it seemed like we just went right on stage. Uh, I plugged my pedal board into the Fender Twin amp that they had provided for me on the stage. I gave a, a quick test and everything sounded good. So I let the band know that I was ready to start. So we started the first song. And about 20 seconds into the song, something happened to my pedal board. I started getting the, the big, the, you know, the big hum of death. That usually meant that I had a bad chord. So I, I sprung into action. I quickly started getting all this troubleshooting going on. Uh, you know, song was still playing. I'm pulling this chord. I'm pulling that chord. I'm trying to find the culprit. And I couldn't do it. It, it, it was getting really close to when I was supposed to play a, a lead part to the song. So I, I had to make a decision. I had no choice. I went Old school, I plugged straight in to the twin and just cranked it up with no pedals. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was not one of those magic Fender twins that just sounded great when you cranked it. It was not at all. It was the opposite. It was kind of dull, and every time I tried to play a note, it felt like it was fighting me. But at that point, it was all I had, so I made the best of it. I turned around and played my lead as best I could with not so great a tone. But as I turned around, I quickly remembered while I was so excited to play this particular festival because I saw Sonny Landra standing there talking to someone. He was off to the side of the festival and my heart just sunk. I felt like I was turning bright red with embarrassment. And I'm sure he wasn't even paying any attention, but, but to me, it just felt terrible to sound so bad in, in front of one of my guitar heroes. So to me, getting your right tone, I know it's super important. 
when when you're playing on gear that that it's not that great or it's just wrong for the style that you're playing it's like you're playing with one arm tied behind your back it makes everything more difficult so part one of this series starts with the most important part of your tone we're going to focus on that today and that's your guitar so thank you so much for joining me on the show today and let's go ahead and get started with the main topic right The Path to Great Guitar Tone, Part 1, The Guitar. One of the most frequent questions I get is about guitar tone. How to get your guitar to sound the way you imagine it to be. How to love the way you sound so much that you're inspired to create the most awesome music just effortlessly. You might not even have a good idea what that sound is that you want. You just know that it isn't how you currently sound. I can see it in the eyes of whoever's asking me the question. It's like, just tell me what to buy and I'll buy it. Just name the amp or guitar or whatever and I'll I'll run out and get it. Then I'll never have to think about this mess again and I'll sound fabulous and, and I'll ride off into the guitar sunset. I wish it was that easy. And those of you listening who, who've been through the, the gear rabbit hole know what I'm talking about. It's not an easy question to answer. So when someone asks me that, I generally start with my best uh, Sherlock Holmes deductive reasoning. Well, what styles do they like? Are they looking for a lead tone or like a great rhythm tone or, or being able to do both? Are they wanting to play loud in clubs or just, you know, at home? What guitar do they currently have? What amp do they currently have? What pedals do they have? Should I recommend them some cheap stuff or mid-priced or or very expensive things? Could we change the speakers on the amp they already have? Uh, Get new pickups for the guitar? Maybe a new pedal that will get them in the ballpark to the desired tone? Uh, Are they willing to carry something really heavy or do we need to find something light? Or how about just a whole new guitar? Would that get them closer? So you see, it's not so easy. (laughs) Uh, Even if I was able to put my finger on what I... think would be a great setup for you everyone has different tastes and you might hate what i think sounds good and you'd be right and i'd be there's no right or wrong to it uh getting great or or even good guitar tone it's a process and say you have unlimited funds and the best way to go if if the money's no you know problem for you is to go with trial and error just buy what looks good to you and Try it out. And if it's not right, just buy something else and repeat <laughs> until you finally find the ultimate setup for you and you're good to go. Sounds good. But okay, let's get back to the real world. I'll stop right there. That's not going to happen for the most of us. The vast majority of us have a limited amount of money, if any, that we can afford to spend on guitar gear. And that puts on pressure, right? It makes you feel like you've got to get this thing right from the first time. We have to find the ultimate setup in a a limited price range that fits the style and the function that we need. Oh, yes. One other thing, it's, it's got to look cool, too. It's got to be impressive. We have to be able to set the gear up and be able to look at it at all times and be ready to go whenever we need it. So next you start to shop. It might be online. It might be at a music store. It could be one from one of those cool catalogs that are sent to you in the mail once a month. Uh, it make the, you know, those catalogs make the guitars and the amps look so good. Uh, you go back and forth. You, you find some stuff you like. You sweat over the d- decision. You, you find a different, you know, a few different options. You weigh all the factors. If I can get this, then I can do this. But... If I get this one, it'll sound a whole different way. 99% of the time, the things you've picked are way over your budget. So the pressure gets even more intense. How can I make this happen and still be able to pay the bills? What would my wife or my husband or whoever, or, or, you know, what would they say if, if I brought this expensive stuff home? 
Or if you really have it bad, you start thinking, where can I put this so it's not really noticed? <laughs> or even worse, where can I hide this <laughs> after I buy it? Don't do it. Don't go down that route. You can see what start where we started was a good idea to get some good equipment to help you. But that's turned south. Things aren't so exciting and positive anymore. You start to carry a very heavy load. All this just to be able to go play a few songs. There's a big problem. The problem is there are too many variables. There's too many cool things to choose from. It's overwhelming. It is intense. All right, so let's talk about what happens after you make your decision. You've done it. You finally pulled the trigger. You think, okay, uh, we can put off the braces for the kids for a few more months or something like that. You know, you, you try to make yourself feel better for spending the money. But then after you buy it and you made your decision, the next stage kicks in and that is the waiting. The waiting for your new gear. The constant checking of the tracking numbers. What city is it in now? I hope they didn't just throw my expensive new amp into the back of the UPS truck. What will I do if it's damaged? I don't want to send it back and have to wait all over again. I'll just fix it if it's broke. What time does the shipper usually get to my house? If I take off work that day, I can be here to greet him at the door. <laughs> so, oh no, you check it again. There's a weather delay. So he start thinking, oh, I hope the truck didn't get into an accident. And my amp is in a million pieces all over the highway. You can just stop it. It can be very intense, but at some point your, your stuff's going to get to you. And that's when the excitement kicks in. There it is. It's like it's Christmas morning in April. You, you tear the box open. You get the warm smell of the styrofoam and the plastic bags and that, that new electronic smell. And it, it greets you and, and you, and it's on, you get it out of the box. You, it's time to crank that thing up or tune it up, or, or grab some patch cables. Hopefully everything you needed is included. You know, that's always a problem. But you, you plug it in, you turn it on, you throw the directions away, <laughs> and then it happens. Hopefully your new gear is everything you dreamed it would be, and you're ready to go. But that's not always the case, and it can be devastating. A huge letdown. What you spent your hard-earned money on, it's just not exactly what you wanted it to be. You quickly think, I must not have it set up or adjusted properly. I, I need to change some of the knobs there. So you, 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 you make a mad dash for, for wherever you threw the directions. And then you rip that open, skim through as fast as you can until you get to the information you're looking for. And hopefully you were right. With just a few adjustments, and then everything starts to sound good. But that's not always the case either. You might spend the next several days trying to get things to sound right. You, you just don't understand why this piece of gear, it's not working for you. And then you got to make a decision. Am I going to send it back? Or am I going to keep it and hope for the best? You start doing lots of research after that. You try to see what the famous guitar players... If, who use that same piece of gear, how, how do they use it? Is there a trick to getting it to sound a certain way? And, and a lot of times, if you spend some time with the gear, it's it might start to grow on you, though. It might not be exactly what you wanted, but it's usable. You know, it's it's just a, such, such a pain to box the thing up and ship it back. So maybe I'll just keep using it and I'll get better at using it. And then after a while... Your eye will start to wander again. <laughs> You'll start looking at some more gear. You'll keep seeing maybe that other piece of gear that you, you, you were thinking about getting. And, and, and you wonder if you made the wrong decision. And before long, it starts all over again. You're back to checking tracking numbers. <laughs> and then you're in it all over again. The gear rabbit hole. The accumulation of gear over time. By trial and error of guitars and guitar amps and guitar pedals and guitar accessories. Oh, there's other problems with gear as well. Uh, for example, that amp that maybe you got and you've been using it at home and it sounds great at the, 
at a low volume. It could be when, when you, you go to play it with a band, it's, it, maybe it's not powerful enough. It's struggling to keep up with the drummer. And you think, oops, I guess I should have gone for the 50 water. Or, or it could be that it sounds wonderful by itself when you practice. But when you play with a band, it just doesn't, the sound doesn't cut through. Your tone might be getting covered up by all of the other instruments. There's so many ways to, to go wrong when you're playing the gear, the gear game. Uh, the first thing that most do when they're, they're trying to get away from this, this rabbit hole is they ask people a lot of questions. And that's a smart way to start. But you still have to deal with that differing opinion thing. You know, everybody, every, certain things that sound good to one person doesn't sound good to others. I mean, think about it this way. If you heard Kirk Hammett from Metallica play a show using Albert Lee's gear, <laughs> who plays country style, clean chicken picking stuff. It, Kirk's Hammett, uh, Kirk Hammett's playing. It just wouldn't have the same impact that it normally would with all his, you know, big cabinets and distortion and all that stuff. So, so what you need to win at this game, the gear game is you need, you need knowledge and you need experience. Those are both tough to come by without wasting a whole lot of time and a lot of money. So I've decided to bring my ideas to you to try to help you with the, that first part, the knowledge part, the understanding, the basics of guitar gear. It's that's ex- essential to keep you away from the frustration. In this first episode of the path to great guitar tone, I'm, I'm going to give you the starting point, the name of the game for getting a hold on all of this gear. And that is we're going to have to do some generalizing. That's right. Generalizing. <laughs> there are too many brands. There's too many models. There's too many styles. There's too many cabinets. There's too many gauges of things. There's too many styles. There's too much of everything to make an informed decision one way or the other about what you need to get for your tone. And to make it worse, there's always a new model of something coming around the corner that, and it, you know, they always promise you the pure awesomeness of the new gear. So we're going to have to classify all this stuff. We're going to have to break it down. If we're going to be able to decide what gear we want without making a big mess of everything. So the, the first thing to do is we need to get a very generalized overview of the type of gear that's been successful in a certain style of music. Once you're comfortable knowing what the classic gear is and what it sounds like, then it makes it much easier to be able to branch out from there and then try some new and different things in an effective way. So let's get to it. Today I'd like to start with the most challenging, and that's electric guitar. Uh, electric guitar. Let's start with the types. Uh, talking first about the general types of guitars you might find when you're shopping around. Uh, there's three main types. and uh, Those are solid body guitars, semi-hollow body guitars, and hollow body guitars. The first solid body, it's usually what you think of when you hear the words electric guitar. Uh, it's it's body's made of a solid piece of wood. And it has a, it's got a full and kind of a snappy sound. You'd want to have a solid body guitar for, for many different styles of music. Um, but a cool thing about the solid body guitar, it's not prone to feedback. So it's great for use if you're playing loud music. The next type of guitar that you'll find is called the semi-hollow body. And this guitar is made, it's made with a solid piece of wood down the middle of the body. But on the sides of the body, it has some hollowed out chambers. You may have seen these guitars with it. They have the classic F holes, uh, kind of like violins on each side of those. A semi-hollow guitar adds some warmth to the sound th- than you would get on a regular solid body. And it, you know, but it doesn't sound too hollow, like an acoustic or a fully full hollow body. Um, you'll see semi-hollow guitars played in a lot of styles of music at will. Uh, and they are a bit more prone to feedback than a solid body, but with care, you can play them very effectively in loudish type bands. Um, the last type of guitar is the hollow body. And this is an electric guitar. It's got some sort of pickup on it, but it's fully hollow. 
just like an acoustic guitar. These guitars will also be seen with F holes as well on the side. They have a very warm sound and they will have a lot of feedback. You know, the ooh, 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 if you're played in too loud, loud of a situation, you'll usually see these guitars played most in jazz settings. They have the warmest sound of the three types. Okay, so those are the three types. Now we're going to switch to the styles of guitars. And this is where we're going to get into the things that you'll see and kind of place them into different uh, different types of music that you want to play. There are several common styles of electric guitars. Um, and later I will go through the different styles of music that the, these guitars are suited for. But for now, a good basic understanding of the different styles is very important. So we're going to start with the big three. Uh, the big three, the uh, first one of the big three is called the Stratocaster. Uh, the Fender Stratocaster is probably the most iconic solid body electric guitar. It, it was made popular by tons of guitarists like Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. It's very comfortable to play, and it's easily recognizable by the double cutaway. It's one of the most comfortable guitars to play because it has a contour on the back of the guitar feels nice up against you and the sound you get from the strat is commonly used in blues music and rock music but it's been used in lots of different styles of music it's also very versatile to do that because of the three single coil pickup design that it has you can get a lot of different sounds out of it using those three pickups it's never a bad idea to have a strat in your arsenal of guitars you'll use it uh, there have been so many variations on the Strat as well from other companies over the years. Uh, you've you got your Ibanezes, your Jacksons, your Charvels, <laughs> all those kind of metal guitars that are based on a Strat, but they're souped up. Um, they've got that comfortable Strat body, but they probably have humbucking pickups on it instead of single coils. And that, that gives you a tone that's suited for heavier rock music. And, and also they... Uh, for some reason, they're a lot easier to play. For um, I think that it's the radius is flatter on the fretboard. I know on those Ibanez, they have a really flat radius, and you get the strings really down low uh, without a lot of buzz. So there's some definite different things that people have done to that idea of the Stratocaster over the year, that years that you'll see. The next of the big three is the Telecaster. The Fender Telecaster, it's another solid body electric guitar but this is commonly associated with country music. And a lot of that's because of the bridge pickup it has on it. The pickup at the bridge gives you that bright country twang. Um, it, it, that's essential for chicken picking style uh, music. It, it only has two single coil pickups and it's a little less comfortable to play than a Strat uh, because it doesn't have a contour in the back. It's just kind of, of a hard cut right there. And you've only got the single cutaway. You don't have it cut away in both places um, by the neck. The Telecaster is used in many other styles, though, not just country. You know, just think Bruce Springsteen. He, you know, he played a, always played a telly. Um, and think about Prince. Prince, he didn't play a He played a telly style guitar. Um, so if you're looking for a very rootsy type, is that a word, rootsy? Rootsy type sound, it's hard to beat a Telecaster. Okay, the last of the big three is the Les Paul. The Gibson Les Paul is commonly associated with rock music. It's got a mahogany body with a maple cap and has two humbucker pickups in it. And that gives it a strong and darker tone that's perfect for rock. Um, the sound of Allman Brothers relied heavily on the Gibson Les Paul. Uh so that's something you could hear if you wanted to hear uh, a little bit about that. It's usually a bit on the heavy side, though. It's a heavy guitar. Uh, but, but, you know, you can buy them now that they have, they, they, they chamber them out a little bit. They lessen some of the weight. But it's been a, it's a heavy guitar. Um, it's known for rock and roll. But it got its start really in jazz from its namesake, Les Paul. He was more of a, you know, his style of music. Um, and another great thing about the Les Paul, it can take high amounts of volume without feeding back. So that's the big three, but I've got a couple more here that are honorable mention. Okay, so we have the SG. This is a Gibson guitar too, 
Um, it started off as a version of a Les Paul. Um, it was like a lighter version. Uh, and it's a solid body too. But you've you've seen these before. It, it's known by its kind of dual horn-like cutaways um, where the body meets the neck. Uh, you've probably seen pictures of Dwayne Allman, Derek Trucks, Angus Young, or Pete Townsend playing in SG. Uh, it, it was, like I said before, it was originally called a Les Paul before uh, Gibson renamed it a few years after it, the production started. It uses dual humbucker pickups just like the Les Paul. But the tone of the guitar is a little bit different. It's a little snarlier. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, the neck can be, I, I've played a few, and sometimes it can be a little neck heavy. You know, when you we put the strap on, it kind of wants to slide over towards the neck a little bit. It's um, a little different. But the tone and the way it's constructed also makes this guitar great for playing slide. You'll see a lot of slide players playing in SG. Another honorable mention is the Flying V. It's another popular type of Gibson solid body guitar. It's been used by Albert King, Freddie King, Lenny Kravitz, Jimi Hendrix. You'll see everybody uh, playing a Flying V. It's It functions exactly like the other Gibson solid bodies with two humbucking pickups. And it looks very cool, but don't try and play it while you're sitting down. It'll slide, <laughs> slide right off. Uh, flying V's and the copies of Flying V's from other manufacturers have also been very popular as metal guitars. Another honorable mention is the 335. This is a semi-hollow guitar from Gibson. It's used in many styles of music, most notably blues, rock, and jazz. It functions just like all the other Gibson guitars with two humbuckers. But the sound that comes out of the guitar is warmer because of those hollow sides. Uh, Larry Carlton is known for playing this style of guitar. He even named one of his most famous songs. It was called Room 335. He named it after the guitar. Uh, it's a very pretty guitar. And it's got the F holes on the side, which always look cool. But it can surprise you. Because of the width of the body, it feels it's, it's a big feeling guitar. And also, you can. I had one that was a lot heavier than you would you would think it was. So you have to take that in consideration. Okay, so there's lots of other types of guitars. I'm not trying to make an exhaustive list list of guitars here. I just wanted to describe the most common ones, so you have an idea of the functions and some of the issues that these guitar has. I uh, I suggest that you try as many of these types of guitars out if you can. Uh, maybe take a trip down to the local music shop. Um, plug them in, hear the sound, and see if it's right. It's a right fit for you or the style of music you're playing. The more you know about these guitars, the more informed a decision you can make before putting your hard-earned money down. Also, if you've made a decision on a certain type of guitar, don't assume that you have to get the most expensive one. All of these guitar companies have guitars in these styles that we talked about, but at different price ranges. Um, with Squire, which is Fender's lower price range, you can get a great guitar for a very low price. And the same is for Epiphone. That's uh, Gibson's lower line. Okay, so we've boiled uh, the, the types of guitars for the styles down, but let's get even more general. Let's get a, let's get a list. Let's narrow this down to the common ideas to what style of guitars is best suited for a certain style of music. So let's say for blues music, Usually you'll see players either play a Strat or a 335. For rock music, you'll see a Strat or a Strat style or all of the Gibson solid bodies that we talked about and even a 335 and you'll even find Tele. So with rock music, you, you can use a lot of different styles of guitar and make them work. For country music, you'll see a lot of Telecasters and lately I've been seeing a lot of Gretsch guitars but with two humbucker pickups or filter tron pickups, not even the humbuckers, the filter tron, but they, they have that two, uh, two pickup spread like a Les Paul for metal guitars. You, you have a lot, you have the, the super strat style guitars or Gibson style solid bodies. Those two, something that can take a lot of volume without feeding back. And for jazz, you will have a whole, a hollow body guitar or a semi hollow body 335. You'll see a lot of those. Okay, so that was a super generalized list, though. It's just to help you get an idea of what has worked in the past. 
There are no rules when it comes to this stuff. You can play any guitar or on any style you want. There's no rules. Who knows? You might even start the new trend <laughs> in your style of guitar. We need some new trends. We don't, haven't had a, hell, a whole lot of them lately. So, so feel free to experiment. But know what the uh, common guitar style uh, guitars are for the style. Let's talk next a little bit about pickups. You heard me talk a lot about pickups for, for the uh, past few minutes. And, and what is so important about these pickups? The guitar pickups are so important to the tone that you're after. A guitar that uses, uses an uncommon set of pickups may not sound the best for your style of music. There are lots of different types of guitar pickups, but there are really two main ones that we've talked about today. That's single coil and humbucker. Single coil pickups are commonly found in Fender guitars. Although Gibson has its own version of them, I think the P90, um, but single coil pickups, Fender guitars, they have a nice, bright, punchy sound. They work great for blues, for country, and for rock, but sometimes they can sound a bit thin depending on the pickup. The big problem with single coil pickups though is the noise. Because of the design of the single coil pickup, they tend to pick up a lot of interference in the form of hum and buzz, especially if you're playing close to some fluorescent or neon lights. Uh, and the problem gets worse when you start to add overdrive and distortion to your tone. It's most notable, noticeable when you're not playing, but you still have the volume knob turned up. And this has driven a lot of guitar players, myself included, crazy over the years and manufacturers have have tried for many years to get pickups with a single coil sound but without the hum and i have a few different types of those that, and they all sound really good but the sound of real single coil pickups is so good it's hard to beat so many just get used to dealing with the hum myself included uh humbucker pickups are a bit different design though I'm sure you've seen them. They look like two single coil pickups stuck together. The way these pickups are wired, they buck the hum. They cancel out the interference and give a noise-free experience. But in doing this, the tone is different. It's a more compressed, beefier sound that has less highs than the single coil does. And this sound is perfect for rock and metal and even jazz. The, the, there's also a lot more output from this pickup than, than the other one, than a single coil. The humbucker is able to push an amplifier a little bit harder, and that also changes the sound. Humbuckers are known to be used in Gibson guitars, but they're used in many other manufacturers' guitars. Fender even puts them in their guitars sometimes. Not all pickups sound the same. Not all single coil pickups sound the same, and the same goes for humbuckers. Uh, the, the way the coils are wound and the materials that are used in the pickup can greatly affect the sound. There's lots of companies that sell, all they do is sell replacement pickups that can give you different sounds for your guitar. All you got to do is replace your pickups. If you have a guitar that just doesn't sound right, you might want to look into replacing the pickups. It can be a whole lot cheaper than getting a new guitar. Uh, some new pickups could turn your least favorite guitar overnight into your favorite. Okay, so we've boiled down all of the many different types and styles of guitars to a few common ones that have been used to get the sounds that we're used to hearing. This, like I said before, is no means a, com uh, a complete list. It's just a starting point. Every style of guitar th that I talked about today has many different variations. And there are many other companies other than Fender and Gibson that make great guitars that are heavily influenced by these classic designs. And their own originally, they have also have their own original designs as well. The frustration a player has deciding on what guitar to purchase in the beginning is no fun. But understanding a little of the history of these classic guitars and the sounds they make is essential knowledge to make an informed decision before you buy. Like I said before, try these out if you can. Take a trip to a music store or ask a friend who has some good guitars. Ask them if you can try them out you'll be surprised at the difference they have and how they feel and how they sound when you're able to play them yourself for a while. This has been just part one of our path to great guitar tone. We'll soon take the same approach to amps, pedals, and more. 
We'll find out what generally works for a certain style and break these choices down into smaller categories. That way you know what to try before you just start purchasing a bunch of gear and hoping for the best. I have a question for you. What was your experience buying your first guitar? Did it work out great? Or did you end up stuck with a guitar that you knew was just going to hold you back? Let us know in the show notes at www.playguitarpodcast.com forward slash zero one seven. We would all love to hear about your experience. This is listener feedback. This is where if you have a comment or a question I can help you with. I will try my best to help you. To get in touch, you can always email me at feedback at playguitarpodcast.com. You can use the comments on the show notes page, which is www.playguitarpodcast.com forward slash 017. Or you can use the contact form on my site. But the coolest way to leave a question for the show is by my SpeakPipe voicemail. When you go to the main page of PlayGuitarPodcast.com, go to the right of the screen, you'll see the little button there that says send voicemail. And you can record a little message and I'll use it on the show if you like. Um, you can also get to that on the contact page. Okay, so first today um, is I got an email from Jason from Melbourne again. And he let me know he thought the last week podcast was awesome. And he, and, uh, he said, I gave my year's worth of lessons in one podcast. Uh, that's what I was shooting for. <laughs> uh, he's been, he says he's been trying out the examples that I mentioned and he was curious about what chords I played underneath those examples, what the chord progressions were. And I didn't go into that a whole lot because I was focusing on the, the patterns, but that's not a problem. Let's take a look. So let's see. And the first thing I did, um, I was, I was demonstrating the minor blues progression. That was kind of the example I gave you why I started even messing with this scale. I, was, I needed to play a minor blues. And that was, I think that was just an A minor chord and to a D minor chord back and forth a few times. Uh, and then the turnaround was an F7 to an E7 and back to an A minor. The next section, we slid the, um, the minor pentatonic in A, we slid it back a few frets to, to turn it into a major pentatonic. And for that section, I used in the A chord, an A major chord, um, and then it would go back and forth between the A major chord and then a D over A. That's a D major chord with an A in the bass, back and forth. And then there was a an E chord back to an A chord. Those are the chords I used for that. For the natural minor sounding uh, example, I just went back and forth between an A minor chord and a D minor chord. For the Dorian uh, example, where I turned it turned the pentatonic into a more of a Dorian sound, that was a cooler chord. That's an A minor eleventh chord, and I went back and forth between that A minor eleventh to a D seven chord, just back and forth between those chords. It's a neat sound. Uh, the next one I did was a full major. So I, I I added two notes to the minor pen, to the major pentatonic to make it a full major scale, and that was just an A chord back and forth between the A chord and then a D over A, a D with an A in the bass. The next section was was uh, we were playing over the dominant. We we t we turned the uh, major pentatonic into a dominant scale by adding two notes, and that was an A seven chord to a D major chord back and forth. After that, there was the Lydian example, and that used a neat chord. That's an A5 add 9 chord, which is really pretty. Pretty chords in open position. Um, over the Jeff Beck sounding pattern, which was next, uh, which is more of a dominant Mixolydian type sound, um, that was an A7 over D, back and forth, just like we did before in the dominant. And also the next one I did, when we turned the major pentatonic into Mixolydian, that was an A7 and then a D, back and forth. The last one I did was we added a little harmonic minor flavor to a minor pentatonic, and that was just over an A minor chord. So there you are. <laughs> That's all of them. I just looped some. They're, they're easy, easy progressions, um, and I didn't want them to. I just wanted you to really be able to hear what changes we're making on those minor pentatonic scales. So thank you, Jason. I hope these progressions will help you 
work with those and get you all those new sounds. I also heard from Chris uh, from the UK this week, and he was going to try out the pentatonic stuff when he could get to his guitar. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and I hope you get some more mileage out of those pentatonics. And also, a big thank you to Runs With Wolf on iTunes for the great rating in the comment. I, um, I hadn't checked into iTunes in a while, and I, and I just saw you did. I think you did it a week or two ago. Um, so thank you so much, Runs With Wolf. I really appreciate it. So that's a wrap. Thank you for joining me today for the Play Guitar Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the show on iTunes or your podcast player. Also, I'd really appreciate it if, I, if you could leave an iTunes review for the show, just like Runs With Wolf did. Um, if you're interested in online lessons, go on over, over to PlayGuitarAcademy.com and join my early adopter list to get news on the opening of the site and an early adopter discount. Also, follow me on all of my different social media pages. Links to them are at www.PlayGuitarPodcast.com. Thanks again, everybody, and I'll see you on the next episode.